sure that John Okay. You're good to go? Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Summer Sizemore. I'm one of the PGY1 pharmacy residents. And today I'm going to be reviewing antimicrobial resistance and some of our new antibiotics to target resistant gram negative organisms. I have no financial or other disclosures that would impact the integrity of this presentation. The objectives by the end of this presentation are to state reasons drug resistance occurs and basic mechanisms of resistance, list the clinical niche for newer antimicrobial agents for multi-drug resistant organisms, and be able to identify dosing adjustments, monitoring parameters, and major drug interactions. Between 1962 and 2000, there were no new major classes of antibiotics that were approved to treat common and deadly gram-negative infections. As a basic definition, the Centers for Disease Control, or the CDC, define antibiotic resistance as when germs, so bacteria or fungi, develop the ability to defeat the antibiotics designed to kill them. So the question is, is there a serious threat with antimicrobial resistance? Well, more than 2.8 million antibiotic resistant infections occur in the US every year. And as a result of this, more than 35,000 people die annually. This here is a timeline of resistance. Um, you'll see the top row is the date of resistance identified and the bottom row um, is, sorry, the date that the antibiotics were developed and then the top row is when resistance was identified. So for example, the blue circles, you'll see that penicillins were discovered in 1928 and resistance was identified in 1940, so shortly after. And you'll see that a lot of the different antibiotic classes follow this same trend. So shortly after they're um, the antibiotics are discovered, resistance develops. And then looking at this orange circle, so 30 years have passed since a new class of antibiotics was last introduced. So we're having a lot of resistance to the current available agents, but no new antibiotic classes to target this resistance. So how, from a very, very general standpoint, does resistance spread? So we can look at it through a lot of different ways. So spreading through people, animals, and the environment, and they're all kind of interconnected. So in terms of people, about 47 million doses of inappropriate antibiotics are prescribed annually from US doctor's offices and emergency departments. So an example of this would be carbapenem resistant Enterobacteraceae, abbreviated as CRE, which can survive in sink drains and spread to patients via wastewater. Coming from animals, resistant bacteria can spread through food or contact with animals, and then animal waste can contain trace antibiotics and resistant organisms. So this ties into the environment where resistant bacteria or fungus can spread through agents applied to crops to manage crop disease. And then human and animal waste can also introduce antibiotics into the environment. So the CDC puts out um, an antibiotic resistant threat report. And the most recent one was in 2019. And what they do is they look at a lot of different um, pathogens and they organize them by urgent, serious, concerning, and watch list. So the classification for these organisms is going to depend on their clinical impact, how much of an impact do they have worldwide, what is the incidence, what is the 10-year proje projection. So maybe it's fine now, but resistance is developing really quickly that we anticipate no agents to treat these bacteria in the future, how easily they are transmissible, uh, availability of effective antibiotics, and any barriers to prevention. So looking at the CDC's urgent threats, so the most serious categorization, we have carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter and carbapenem resistant Enterobacteraceae. These are two of the organisms that we're going to go into depth, but there are five total uh, bacteria that uh, are available or organisms on the urgent threat list. The CDC serious threat list, so there's a lot more organisms on this list, but the ones we're going to talk about today are extended spectrum beta lactamase producing Enterobacteraceae and multi-drug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Recently, the IDSA, so the Infectious Diseases Society of America, came out with guidelines with guidance on the treatment of antimicrobial resistant gram-negative infections. And this guideline looked at three of the four bacteria that we're gonna be discussing today. So you'll see I do reference the IDSA guidelines a few times today. First, we're gonna be discussing ESBL Enterobacteraceae. So Enterobacterialis represents an order. So if we go back to our basic chemistry classes, uh, organisms can be characterized by domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, going down to um, a very specific level to help us identify the bacteria. 
So Enterobacteraceae represents the family and commonly included organisms under the following genuses are the ones that we're gonna be more familiar with. So Enterobacter, Escherichia, Klebsiella, Shigella, Salmonella, Proteus, those are gonna be the genus. And then we can go down to the species level. So you'll usually see organisms presented as genus followed by species, for example, Escherichia coli or E. coli. So Enterobacteraceae species, the few ways that they develop resistance, first being acquisition of plasmids that encode for ESBLs. So that stands for extended spectrum beta lactamases, but they often carry other resistant genes as well. They can develop resistance to third generation cephalosporins through AMPC production, and then quinolone resistance as a result of chromosomal mutation altering target enzymes. ESBLs can be classified in a few different ways, but the most common is the Ambler classification system. So the Ambler classification system uh, ranks beta-lactams by class. So there's class A, B, C, and D. Class A is gonna be our extended spectrum beta-lactams and our carbapenemases. So there's TEM, SHEV, uh, the CTX, and KPC genes. B is our metallo-beta-lactamases. So EMP, VEM, and NDM, which stands for New, New Delhi metallo-beta-lactamases. C are our cephalosporinases, so AMP-C. D are oxotype enzymes, and they're um, mo the most common being oxa. So first assessment question, which of the following is a metallo-beta-lactamase? We have A, the CTXM, B, AMP-C producers, C, NDMs, and D, oxas. Yes, good job, Corey. So C, NDMs are gonna be our uh, metallo beta, is one of the metallo beta lactamases. So expended, extended spectrum beta lactamases are enzymes that inactivate most penicillins, cephalosporins, and estreonam. So any gram negative organism can carry these genes, but the most common are gonna be Escherichia coli or E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Klebsiella oxytoca, and Proteus mirabilis. There are many variants of ESBL genes, including the ones we just discussed, so CTXM, TEM, and SHIV, and ESBL genotype testing is not routinely done. So the way we know something is an ESBL producer is we'll look at non-susceptibility to ceph triaxone. So we can look at the MIC, and if it, which stands for minimum inhibitory concentration, and if that's greater than or equal to two on our susceptibility report, that may be indicative that it's an ESBL producing agent. And I uh, wanted to briefly review the mechanism of extended spectrum beta-lactamases. Beta so what makes something a beta-lactam beta is this ring here, the beta-lactam ring. And a beta-lactamase, so it ends in ACE, so we know that it's an enzyme. What it does is it cleaves right here in between the beta-lactam ring, opens up the antibiotic, and the antibiotic is no longer effective against the bacteria we're trying to treat. And then I also wanted to go into what, um, how did we determine that MIC for ceftriaxin? So the optimal ceftriaxin MIC, this study looked at um, what, what are we gonna use as the cutoff to confirm ESBL producing organisms. So looking at the bottom of this table, it's got the MICs and then looking at the um, Y axis, you'll have the number of cases. So with an MIC of one, 1,007 cases were non-ESBL producing, but there were zero that were ESBL producing. But then when we move over to an MIC of two, you'll see that five of them were ESBL producers and 15 were non-ESBL producers. So this is kind of where we get that um, cutoff of two for the MIC, because at that MIC, you're not 100% sure that the organism is ESBL producing. So now looking into our treatment options. So I'm referring to the IDSA guidelines because they provided specific guidance for what to do with ESBL enterobacteriales. And what they do is they split it up into urinary source infections and then infections outside of the urinary source. So for simple cystitis, so a simple urinary tract infection, they actually recommend macrobid, so nitroferentoin or trimethoprim trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole as the preferred treatment agents. And a lot of times providers will see ESBL organisms and assume that we do have to go straight to carbapenems, but IDSA does recommend that we use nitroferentoin or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for simple cystitis. When the infection extends beyond just simple cystitis, so it's pyelonephritis reaching into the kidneys or complicated UTI, which is defined as structural or functional abnormality of the genitourinary tract or any UTI in a male patient, 
that is when we're going to probably want to go to our carbapenem. So ertapenem, miropenem, imipenem, psilostatin, or we still have the option to use ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin. So our fluoroquinolones and our trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole are still treatment options. When we go outside of the urinary tract, that's when we're probably going to want to use our carbapenem. So miropenem, imipenem, and ertapenem. But they do specifically mention the option for oral step-down therapy to either fluoroquinolones or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So you, when knowing that carbapenems are our, our biggest gun antibiotics and they cover their very broad spectrum, when the patient is clinically improving, that's when we would wanna consider going down to oral step-down therapy with a less broad spectrum agent. So now we have a patient case and this patient is a 55 year old female who endorses dysuria, urgency and frequency when urinating. She denies any flank pain. She has allergies to sulfa and penicillins and her renal function, her creatinine clearance is at 95 milliliters per minute. So she had a urinalysis that was suggestive of a UTI, but you always have to correlate a urinalysis with symptoms to diagnose a UTI. So she has dysuria, urgency and frequency, and you can say a positive UA. To the right, you'll see this is her culture and susceptibility report. She was growing extended spectrum beta-lactamase E. coli. So what antibiotic uh, options would you use to treat this patient's cystitis? And just to clarify, we are saying it's cystitis because she's not having the flank pain. So we're not thinking it is extending beyond um, just the bladder. So what antibiotic options would you use to treat this patient? B, yeah. So we could use the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole in other patients, but this patient has a sulfa allergy. So we're gonna use nitrofurantoin. Great job. Um, our next agent is carbapenem resistant enterobacteriales. So uh, the CDC defines CRE or carbapenem resistant enterobacteriales as members of the enterobacteriales order that are resistant to at least one carbapenem antibiotic or producing a carbapenemase enzyme. So th there's a few different ways that enterobacteriales bacteria uh, develop antibiotic resistance. So it can be through porin mutations by preventing antibiotic entry into the cell carbapenemase producing, so they produce an enzyme that breaks down the antibiotic, so the antibiotic is no longer effective, and then increased efflux pump expression. So the antibiotic may be able to get into the cell, but you're having pumps that are shooting the drug out of the cell, so it's no longer effective. Some of our newer treatment options for multidrug resistance are ceftazidime, avibactam, miropenem, vaporbactam, imipenem, psilostatin, relibactam, cefidrocol, and aravacycline. Again, this, um, the recommendations for treating CRE stem from the IDSA guidelines. So they break it down urinary source versus non-urinary source. And for simple cystitis, we're still gonna be recommending the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, nitrofurantoin, but this time with the CREs, we also have the options for fluoroquinolones or a single dose of an aminoglycoside. You'll see that miropenem on, based on standard infusion is recommended if it's ertapenem resistant or miropenem susceptible. And our alternative treatment options are going to be those newer agents. So we still want to stick to the, the agents that have been around for a while to treat simple cystitis. Then when we go to pyelonephritis or complicated UTI, that's where these newer agents are going to come in. And you'll notice that the miropenem for cystitis is recommended to be standard infusion versus extended infusion when it's uh, extending beyond just the bladder or it's a complicated UTI. So why do we want to use extended infusion miropenem? So beta-lactams, the way that they are pharmacokinetically optimized is, is that we want to achieve a concentration the time above the MIC. So if we are extending um, infusions of miropenem, the concentration is going to be more steady and it's hopefully going to be above the MIC in the patient. Whereas if we give intermittent dosing, we're giving a bolus and they're going to have a really high peak but that concentration is gonna fall above the MIC until we give that next dose. So this is actually a meta-analysis looking at, should we be doing continuous infusion or just doing intermittent infusion of miropenem? And it looked at a bunch of different studies and the clinical success rates of doing either option. So this right here is going to, um, an odds ratio of one basically means there's no difference between intermittent infusion versus continuous or extended infusion. So each individual bar here is showing all the different studies and if they showed um, improve favoring um, clinical success rates if it's prolonged infusion or um, intermittent infusion. And then this black triangle or the black diamond here um, 
kind of summarizes all of the different studies. And since it's favoring the right side and it's not crossing the line of one for the odds ratio, this indicates that prolonged uh, continuous, continuous or extended infusion improves the odds ratio of clinical success rate in patients. So that makes sense because we're pharmacokinetically optimizing our dosing. And then outside of the urinary source. So treatments for CRE is gonna kind of be based on what our susceptibility results are. So when your uh, organism is resistant to erdipenem and susceptible to miropenem and you don't have carbapenemase testing or you know it's negative, you can do miropenem with extended infusion. So optimizing the pharmacokinetics and the alternative would be ceftazidime avibactam. But when it's resistant to both erdipenem and miropenem, so our usual carbapenems, that's when we're going to use these newer agents. And then alternative treatments are going to be cefidricol and then tigacycline and aravacycline. And the reason cefidricol, since it's one of the newer agents, but it is an alternative treatment, is that it was originally FDA approved for complicated UTIs because there was an increase in mortality seen for infections outside of the urinary source. So that's why it's not going to be one of the initial preferred treatment options. Then if you actually know the carbapenemase that your bacteria is producing, then you can further um, choose and narrow down your therapy and treatment options. So KPC organisms, you see that there's a lot more of these agents available. Our metallobetalactamases, um, there's not as many options. We'll use ceftazidime avibactam in combination with astreonam, or we can use cefidericol. So that's one of the really big benefits of cefidericol is that it provides the um, coverage for metallobetalactamases. And then our OXA48, ceftazidime avibactam is gonna be our primarily uh, preferred agent for OXA48 producing enzymes. And difficult to treat resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa is gonna be our next agent. So this has a lot of different resistance mechanisms that the bacteria can use to, um, and where it's no longer effective against antibiotics. So decreased porin expression, methylation of the 30S ribosomal RNA, beta-lactamase producing. So again, producing an enzyme that um, breaks apart the antibiotic and then it's no longer effective. Aminoglycoside modifying enzymes can be produced. They can mutate the topoisomerase IV and DNA gyrase mutations. So that's the mechanism of fluoroquinolones. Increased efflux pump expression. So pumping the drug out of the cell. So it's no longer effective. And then modification and loss of lipopolysaccharides. So that would be the mechanism in colistin. Diff um, difficult to treat resistant new, new pseudomonas aeruginosa is defined as uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa exhibiting non-susceptibility to all of the following agents. So there's eight total agents, ceftazidime, cefepime, astreonam, miropenem, emipenem, cilostatin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and piperacillin-tazobactam. So to be considered DTR pseudomonas aeruginosa, the agent ha has to be resistant to, the bacteria has to be resistant to all of these agents. Our treatment options include ceftolazine tazobactam, ceftazidime avibactam, imipenem silostatin relibactam, and cefidericol. So again, referencing the IDSA guidelines, they break it down urinary source and non-urinary source. You'll see all the same gram negative, the newer agents that we have are gonna be recommended, but for pseudomonas, a lot more of them are gonna be recommended for simple cystitis. Pyelonephritis and complicated UTI, same situation and then infections outside of the urinary tract. Same situation, a lot of these newer agents are options. And then lastly, we have carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter bomani. So similar mechanisms of actions for resistant as other um, pathogens, decreased porin expression, methylation of the RNA, beta-lactamase producing, aminoglycoside modifying enzymes, topoisomerase and DNA gyrase mutations, increased efflux pump expression, and modification and loss of lipopolysaccharides. There are a few options, so I'm gonna break them down between older and our newer options. So our older options for carbapenem resistant acinetobacter are gonna be colistin, tigacycline, minocycline, sulbactam, and that's gonna actually be dosed on the sulbactam component. And sulbactam is not available by itself in the United States. Um, it's ampicillin sulbactam that you'll have to use, but you dose it to nine to 12 grams daily of the sulbactam component. Aminoglycosides and carbapenems are our current options. But when your agent is carbapenem resistant, some of our newer agents, we have cefidericol, aravacycline, omatocycline, and plazomycin as newer agents, but plazomycin has no additional activity beyond traditional aminoglycosides. 
So now I'm going to review all of these agents. So there's a ton of new agents that you may not have heard of, and they all kind of sound similar. So I'm going to go through each of them, what their current indications are, any monitoring parameters, and what we should remember about each of these drugs. So first, we have ceftazidime avibactam, brand name Avicaz. Its current indications are for intra-abdominal infections, complicated UTIs, and hospital-acquired pneumonia or ventilator-associated bacterial pneumonia. So I'll abbreviate that as HAPVAP. The dosing, two and a half grams IV every eight hours. And what stands out about this is that it's renally dose adjusted, but below 50 milliliters per minute. Coverage to know. So it's active against ESBLs, so our CTX and TEM. It's also active against KPCs, AMPC producing organisms, and OXA48 producing organisms. And it is active against Pseudomonas. Next, we have Zerbaxa or Ceftolazane Tazobactam. Similar uh, indications, intra-abdominal infections, complicated UTIs, and HAPFAP. Interesting about this is the dosing is usually one and a half grams every eight hours, but with the pneumonia indication, it's gonna be double that dose, so three grams every eight hours. And as with other beta-lactams, it's gonna be renally dose adjusted, but this one is uh, 50 milliliters per minute as well. Coverage to know, so ceftazidime and carbapenem-resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa, this is an, um, a situation where we would want to use their Baxa. It has poor activity against ceftazidime-resistant enterobacter species, or CRE, and it has no KPC activity. And this is important because KPC is going to be one of the most common ESBLs in the United States, so we're going to probably be using it for other situations, not the KPC activity. Verification pearls. So use in conjunction with metronidazole is actually recommended in complicated intra-abdominal infections. And usually when we think of beta-lactams with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, we think that it has adequate anaerobic coverage, but it is important to point out that the package insert does recommend adding metronidazole in addition to this infection when it's an intra-abdominal infection. Stability-wise, so we're making it in the IV room, but it's stable for uh, at room temperature for 24 hours. So this is great because it's a beta-lactam that we would want to pharmacokinetically optimize by using a continuous or extended infusion. Sorry, just extended infusion. Um, so a four-hour infusion would help optimize the pharmacokinetics and make sure we're achieving, achieving appropriate concentration of um, time above the MIC. And we also have Vabamir, Mirapenem, Vabrobactam. So the FDA indications are currently only for a complicated urinary tract infection, including pyelonephritis. It's dose four grams IV every eight hours. And the renal adjustment for this is dose based on EGFR rather than creatinine clearance. Um, and it's an EGFR less than 50 milliliters per minute. Some important coverage to know for Mirapenem, Vabrobactam is that it's active against CRE and KPC, but it does not work against metallobetalactamases or OXA48, so that's class B and D. And it does not improve the effect of mirapenem on Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, or Stenotrophomonas species, so there's no additional benefit of having the Vabrobactam as the beta-lactamase inhibitor. And you'll know, so you know that mirapenem is um, commercially produced now, but the beta-lactamase inhibitor, Vabrobactam, is actually what's the novel um, beta-lactamase inhibitor and the novel component of this agent. Verification pearls-wise, so it's going to require an infectious diseases consult. We have it on formulary, but it's something that we don't stock. We'll have to order it if there is a situation where we would need to use it. With um, any carbapenem, so along with meropenem vabrobactam, there is the potential for seizures. And a significant drug interaction is that meropenem or carbapenems in general can cause reduced valproic acid concentrations. So that's something to look for anytime you're verifying a carbapenem. It's also important to note the short stability time once it's mixed. So it's only good for four hours at room temperature, but 22 hours under refrigeration. So this is one that we're not gonna wanna batch early in the IV room um, and send up and stock in the patient's PSB. So um, very short stability time. Next, we have Recarbrio. So this is actually gonna be a three drug, imipenem, silostatin, which is available as a, its own um, separate drug. And we have the addition of Relabactam, so a novel beta-lactamase inhibitor. Its current FDA indications are complicated UTIs, including pyelonephritis, and complicated intra-abdominal infection. It's dosed at 1.25 grams IV every eight hours, and the dose adjustment is actually pretty high for what we're used to, so it's less than 90 milliliters per minute. Coverage to know is that imipenem silostatin relobactam covers carbapenem-resistant Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. Relobactam inhibits ESBL, KPC, and AMPC, 
It has minimal OXA type activity. So if we know our organism is producing OXA, we are not going to be using this agent. And it has no activity against the metallobetalactamases. Because it has a carbapenem component, there is a drug interaction with the valproic acid, but there's also a warning for um, gancyclovir and then divalproex, which is going to be metabolized into valproic acid. It's recommended to avoid this combination. So either choosing an alternative antibiotic, um, because that's a lot easier than recommending an alternative antiepileptic. And you're gonna wanna monitor increases in liver function tests as well. Next, we have Fitroja or Cefiteracol. So the current FDA, the init, initial FDA indication was complicated urinary tract infections. It recently got approval for hospital acquired bacterial pneumonia and ventilator associated bacterial pneumonia. Dosing is two grams IV every eight hours, but something really interesting about this that you, you don't usually see when dosing antibiotics is if the patient's creatinine clearance is actually greater than 120 milliliters per minute, you're gonna uh, decrease the dosing interval. So it's two grams IV every six hours you're also gonna renally dose adjust for a creatinine clearance less than 60. So that's something important to remember. And this is gonna be restricted to ID. And we don't currently keep it in stock and it's one of those that we would order in the event that we do need it. Fetroja or Cefiteracol has a really unique mechanism of action that I think is really fun and worth sharing. So uh, Cefiteracol is a citerophore cephalosporin. So what that means is that it chelates ferric ions and uses bacterial iron transport systems to obtain higher concentrations in the periplasmic space of susceptible gram negatives. So citerophore in Greek translate to iron carrier. So during an infection in the infectious process, the immune system creates an iron pore environment. So what the antibiotic does is it tricks the bacteria into letting it inside of the cell. And so that's where you get the brand name Fetroja, kind of like the Trojan horse. So this uh, mechanism is really unique in that it tricks the bacteria um, into allowing it into the body. Significant um, coverage to know is it actually covers all four Ambler classifications, including New Delhi metallobetalactamases. It also covers drug-resistant Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, and Stenotrophomonas, and it has activity against certain porin deletions and E. coli isolates containing MCR1. The verification pearls to know are that it, you want to monitor liver function tests and that seizures and other CNS side effects have occurred with this agent, so just something to keep in the back of your mind. Zorava or ravacycline is indicated for complicated intra-abdominal infections, and it's going to be weight-based dosing, one mg per keg IV every 12 hours. Coverage is that it covers ESBLs, KPCs, and metallobetalactamases that are carbapenem-resistant enterobacteraceae. Covers multidrug-resistant acinetobacter and stenotrophomonas. And this is important to note that it also has some really great gram-positive coverage. It covers MRSA, so methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. Verification pearls, so aravacycline is only available as an IV option, but still nausea and vomiting is very commonly reported. And it's a tetracycline, so no renally dose adjustments. Nuzira or omatacycline is another tetracycline that's indicated for community-acquired pneumonia, and skin and skin structure infections. The dosing is different based on community acquired pneumonia versus skin and skin structure, but they do both require a loading dose. And then the only difference is for the skin and skin structure infections, you have the option to, to do a PO loading dose instead of community acquired pneumonia, it's just IV loading doses. Important coverage to know, so compared to a ravacycline, um, it does cover ESBL and KPC, but there's no data on the metallobetalactamases still maintains coverage against multidrug resistant acinetobacter and stenotrophomonas, and then covers MRSA and VRE. Omatocycling is available both IV and PO, so convenient for having it um, if you have a patient that you'd like to send home and you don't want them to stay in the hospital to be on antibiotics. As with all tetracyclines, it's not renally adjusted, and it's important counseling-wise that they administer this on an empty stomach fasting for greater than four hours, and then wait two hours after to eat or drink. So ideally in the morning when the patient has been sleeping and has not been eating or haven't, didn't have a late night snack. With tetracyclines, when you have the PO uh, regimens, you want to avoid dairy and other multivalent cations because you don't want it to bind to the antibiotic and then the antibiotic cannot be absorbed. And then lastly, monitor the liver function tests. We have Zemdri, the last op, um, agent. Plasomycin is the generic, and its FDA indication is for a complicated UTI. So it's going to be weight-based dosed IV daily for four to seven days, and then you can follow with an alternative PO therapy for a total of seven to 10 days. 
Dosing depends on the patient's weight, but if they are obese, you're gonna use a 40% adjusted body weight and it's renally dose adjusted for creatinine clearance less than 60 milliliters per minute. Coverage to know is that it's active against ESBL and KPCs. It has reduced activity against Acinetobacter bomani. So like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't have any additional coverage as other aminoglycosides that were previously available. And it lacks activity against Pseudomonas, aeruginosa, Streptococcus species, Stenotrophomonas, and obligate anaerobes. It's IV only, and as other aminoglycosides, you'll know that they have a box warning for nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, and neuromuscular blockade. It can cause fetal harm, so we're gonna want to avoid this in our pregnant patients and those that may be pregnant. And if, their pati if the patient's creatinine clearance is less than 90 milliliters per minute, just as with other aminoglycosides, we can do trough-based dosing, um, and we would want to get concentrations 30 minutes prior to the second dose. So last assessment question, which of the following drugs requires an increase in dosage for a creatinine clearance greater than 120 milliliters per minute? <laughs> B, yes, great job, everyone. <laughs> Um, and then lastly, I'm not gonna go through this table, but um, this is just a new agent comparison chart that looks at all of the different FDA approved indications, the activity, so which extended spectrum beta lactamases these agents cover, what the standard dosing is, when the renal adjust dose adjustments are. So you'll notice a lot of these had very different renal dose adjustments than the, the usual 30 milliliters per minute that we're used to seeing, what their MIC breakpoints are, the infusion time, the stability at room temperature. So really important that these are very expensive drugs and we don't want them to um, go to waste when we are not paying attention to the stability at room temperature. And then lastly, I've included the estimated daily cost. So with that, that concludes my presentation. And um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Does our micro lab provide the specific types of resistance? You mentioned like ESBL can have different subtypes of resistance. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that kind of susceptibility. Do we do that? No, so I've noticed it on the Oh, sorry. So the question is, does our lab report out what um, enzymes are the specific enzymes that the bacteria are producing? And the answer is only on certain situations. So like our bac um, bacteremia, our blood culture IDs, they sometimes will say if it's vancomycin resistant, but it doesn't list out the specific um, enzyme. Our, I noticed that the pneumonia panel lately, it does actually list out some of the different resistance mechanisms, but if it sources other than that, that's not on the biofire, then what we do is we are able, we use a certain test that it looks at if it's um, ESBL producing, but then we send it to the Tennessee Department of Labs, and then they'll identify it for us with PCR-based testing. So some situations we can identify it, but like, for example, on the pneumonia panel, um, we can identify it. And so there are ways to test for it. It's just technology that we don't have here. Yes. A second question. Um, obviously, a very long time ago, colipsin was one of our, colipsin and polymixin was some of our only options for these resistant gram negatives. But I didn't see you mention that in any of the IDFA guidelines for resistant organisms. Are those no longer being used in favor of these newer agents? Yeah, because a, a lot of those, uh, the colistin has a lot of nephrotoxicity associated with it and a lot of toxicities in general. Um, it is recommended as an alternative and agent in a few of these. I can see if I can find one, but it um, it's not going to be rec the preferred agent since we have these newer agents and beta-lactams are generally a lot safer than um, colistin would be, but I can find one. It, it is recommended a few times, but just as alternative agents. So like here with um, Pseudomonas, they have colistin for cystitis. Um, I think that might be one of the only ones. Oh, here we go. Uh, again, cystitis for CRE. So um, we are really trying to limit that when there's no other options available and trying to use these beta-lactams or the newer agents that are a little bit safer. Not that I'm aware of. I'm not sure. Okay. Yes. I can, yes, so, I can. Let me find what slide that was on. Yeah, 
Yes, so um, the question was, um, there's a certain infection where it recommends that we use Avicaz in combination with Ostrianium. So it's uh, related to the resistance that develops to each of those pathogens. Um, let me find which table it was under to show you the specific example. There we go. Um, so carbapenem resistant enterobacteriales, you'll see in this middle section for our metallo beta lactamases that they recommend ceftazidime avibactam with astrianium. So how this works is Avicaz is, um, works against ESBLs, KPCs, and cephalosporinases. So those are gonna be our most common. And then our metallo beta lactamases are notoriously harder to treat. So as Trianam is actually stable against metallo beta lactamases. So you kind of use both of these. So the ceftazidime avibactam component is gonna be stable against all of your um, ESBLs, KPCs and cephalosporinases. And then the as Trianam is gonna actually help with the metallo beta lactamasing um, component. So the ceftazidime avibactam kind of like is um, like a guard dog, I guess, for the, um, to not have the estrianam broken down by the metallobetalactamases since the um, estrianam works against the metallobetalactamases. Yes. Right, so that's, yeah, a lot of these agents, so they may be metallobetalactamase producing, but they can also carry other resistance organisms. So basically combining these two, or technically three agents is going to cover against all the different possible resistant organisms that this could carry. Yes. So a lot of these are members of the beta lactam class. Mm -hmm. um, can you walk us through like what we would do with a penicillin? Sure. Um, so the question was that a lot of these agents are cephalosporins. So it's very common that a patient would present with a penicillin allergy. And it's obviously going to be really important in these situations when there's not that many treatment options that we carefully assess their penicillin allergy. So fun fact, about 90% of patients who say they're penicillin allergic are not actually allergic. And the penicillin allergy can wave over time. So uh, really important to get a history of what the reaction was to um, penicillin or was it a cephalosporin, how long ago it was. So every 10 years that go by, even if it was an IgE mediated type one anaphylaxis, there's an 80 to 100% chance that that patient's no longer allergic to penicillin. So even if the reaction was a really long time ago, I would feel pretty comfortable with using a cephalosporin. Um, the cross reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins is less than like two to 3%. So again, it's not as high of a risk as a lot of people think. Um, and a lot of people are mislabeled penicillin allergic. Okay, hey, thank you so much, everyone.